Hello, hello, and welcome back. Get ready to dive back into the world of weird as we count down the top 10 bizarre real cults you won't believe exist, part two. Let's go. Cut cult is number 10, and they quite literally cut themselves out of a different cult, Summit Lighthouse, their origin. In 1975, founder Elizabeth Glare Prophet pitched herself and her husband as messengers of ascended masters who were believed to be spiritually awakened ancient beings. Because of branching off of one cult wasn't apparently enough, this couple tossed in some other cult elements from Christian science, the I Am movement, and general doomsday cult. Mix that together and shake, and you've got a married couple siphoning money out of growing congregation members to buy land in Montana, which was to be their apocalyptic safe haven. Members worked themselves to the bone and drove themselves into debt, clamoring to reserve a spot in the safe haven and build their fallout shelters. This cult held their flock from leaving by stranding them in this haven, now bankrupt and with nowhere else to go. They used tactics like sleep deprivation and manipulation against any who tried to depart. The prophet retired, not died, just retired one day in 1999 and passed in 2009. Since, the church is still run but with endless legal issues and succession debates. Builders of Aditam is number 9 and it's a super chill group if you can get behind mystic rituals, magic, prophecies and clairvoyancy. Paul Foster Case, a Catholic Freemason, founded this group in 1922. He combed the teachings of Astoric with tarot cards, Masonic imagery and the Kabbalah. Quite a power combo. Anyways, Case saw himself as not divinity but a man sent to quote, accept the enormous responsibility of founding an order dedicated to the welfare of all of mankind. And that's kind of what he's done. This group has had a following of 5,000 members worldwide, excluding those followers who don't pay the membership dues. Like Jesus, who many believed was trained in the Kabbalah, members of BOTA aspire to build the inner temple, to construct the holy of holies within. People of all faiths are welcome to study the teachings of this order. There has been some rumors that BOTA won't allow any LGBTA members to advance in their spiritual journey past a certain level as they are considered unbalanced, but with exception to that, this cult is pretty tame. No money laundering, no frauds, no harming of its followers. It's devoted to the study of mystic rituals, magic, religion, tarot, and ancient spirituality. It wants to sell you a lot of books and lessons, but that's about as dark as it gets. They even have known physicists, authors, and astrologers as part of their group. After the passing of Paul Foster Case, Ann Davis took over the leadership, but she's not as favored as the past Paul. Overall, they're said to have a slow and comfortable process and explanation of their information and practices. You can check out their website as well. Cults go Hollywood with number 8 in the countdown, the Aetherius Society. Known for its residency on Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles, this bizarre group starts in the 1950s with leader Dr. George King, who one day says to have received a cosmic transmission from the interplanetary parliament that explained that Aetherius, an alien from Venus, was our next messiah. King also believed himself to have spoken with many entities he saw as godlike cosmic beings or masters. Jesus is also one of those and also from Venus BTW and the Lord Buddha is another. Naturally, like many cults, Aetherius has predicted the apocalypse. However, the Aetherians of the past and present aren't doom mongers like many other apocalyptic cults. While they know it's coming, they weren't told when. The Aetherians are also quite existential, practicing self awareness and meditation and are acutely aware of global climate issues and politics that affect the currents of our society and our planet. At the center of the Aetherius society is a belief that around the world there are 19 holy mountains, each individually imbued with cosmic significance by George King. Mount Baldy in California is the object of their frequent pilgrimages. With energy they create from their prayer, stored in a crystalline battery and transmitted via radio signal, they endeavor to maintain global peace. You can check out this tranquil but bizarre cult on their website or their Facebook page. Classic rom-com or just comedic? Number 7 is Full Circle Cult. Why the glib comment? Well, this cult is founded and run by Andrew Keegan, best known for his role as Joey in 10 Things I Hate About You. So how did he go from acting to culting? In 2014, Keegan started his new spiritual movement aimed at spiritual millennials in hip and upbeat Venice, California. And Keegan's cult advertised itself as advanced spiritualism, or the highest spiritualism founded on universal knowledge. They also enjoy ayahuasca. This cult offers workshops and community meet and greets that allow for public interaction. Every week, a diverse group of congregants will take part in yoga, cultural gatherings, and ceremonies inside the 110 year old temple at 305 Rose Avenue, one of the oldest buildings in Venice, California. It's also been used as a temple for multiple religions before this cult, which was probably part of the renter's appeal for Keegan. A year into running, Keegan faced fines for the distribution and sales of alcohol without a license when undercover ABC agents confiscated several containers of kombucha that were apparently brewed a little too strongly. This group has also been known to enjoy a little bit of the Mary Jane on the side too. While we don't know if there's any sinister intent in this group, we do know that it has strong 
struggled. Due to big companies like Google and Snapchat moving into the area, rent got too high for the group by 2017 and they're forced to leave their temple. Keegan promises though that the cult isn't over and rather a new level is coming, including sound, healing, education, medical type practices, food and health. This name changer of a cult is number 6, it's the Moonies. Founded by Sung Young Moon in 1940s Korea, this cult is now called the Unification Church and has had many other names. While born in North Korea, he was eventually imprisoned there under a false accusation from the government and when released, Moon fled to South Korea. Before this had occurred, Moon had already been preaching and had his first vision of Jesus appearing to him with the task to establish God's kingdom on earth. With his newfound prison freedom, Moon started his church in South Korea, a mix of Confucian and Christian beliefs mixed with divine prophecies. With that, Moon created the New Bible. Unlike many other cults, this one got big, sitting at around 10,000 members in its prime. When Moon held the infamous mass weddings, they required stadiums for the thousands of attendees. A rejecter of romantic love, weddings were the holy marriage blessing ceremony, a core ritual at which couples are removed from the lineage of sinful humanity and engrafted into God's sinless lineage. In the 70s, the Moonies made their way to the US where they reportedly separated college students from their families through brainwashing. They've also been accused of deceptive recruiting methods, abusive practices, and manipulative financial frauds. This cult has faced lawsuits, government scrutiny, and even had 400 of its members abducted in the 70s and 80s for cult deprogramming. Moon died in 2012 and the religion broke off into three factions, each following a family member. Some follow his widow, who many consider to be a messiah and is now the founder of the Women's Federation for World Peace International. Others followed his eldest son to his Family Peace Association, and others followed his youngest son to the Sanctuary Church. I guess cult leader can be genetic. Here we go again with the brethren at number 5. If you watch part 1 of our bizarre cults, you may think I'm revisiting the same cult. Don't worry, I'm not lazy, it's just that cult leaders aren't creative with their names. This brethren cult was founded by the late Jim Roberts, a preacher's son. He had practiced sermon by 15 and later served in the Marines. This combination of strict religion and disciplinary Marine Corps made for a hardened man with some unique ideology. In Chicago, his religious philosophy paired with leadership skills, charisma, and an air of authority allowed him to gain a small group of congregants by visiting college campuses and public areas. He had about 100 followers under a titan of Hold at the time he ordered everybody to drop out of society nomad style in 1971. He had explained the decision in order to secure a place in heaven, people had to begin purifying themselves, according to the passages of the Bible. Brethren must forsake their families and friends and all material goods. You sew your own clothing and you eat from the dumpster. And of course, all money goes to the leader. Laughing and dancing are a huge no-no, as are children playing and anyone accessing medicine or medical care. Naturally, the cult has been accused of negligence for allowing its members to suffer or even die from perfectly curable illnesses. The only acceptable transport to them is bikes, buses, and hitchhiking to get around. Men wear their hair short and have long beards, and women wear long tunic dresses. Women, of course, are subservient to men, and everyone was subservient to robbers while he was still alive. In 2015, that changed as Robert passed from cancer left undiagnosed from his hatred of medicine. But most converts didn't change anything and remained nomadic. Many are still out there. Thanks to the coordinated efforts by parents of cult followers who created the Roberts Group Parent Network, several members have managed to be deprogrammed and returned home. Ikonakar, a fun word that I'm probably pronouncing wrong, is number 4. Ikonakar and all its frivolousness was made possible by founder Paul Twitchell in 1965. It's a new age religion group and like many other new age religion groups it was really just code for a jumble of mysticism and eastern philosophy mixed with yoga, meditation, tarot cards and made up iconography. Believing all members have ancient roots going back 10,000 years, they were to be given a new name and learn the secretive language of the Ikonars. All of it done in the name of the group's meditation ritual where one chant, HA! and separates their soul from their body. Dreams are regarded as important teaching tools and members often keep journals to facilitate studies. Ekinar teaches that spiritual liberation in one's lifetime is available to all, that it is possible to achieve self-realization. This group started in Minnesota, Canada and it's now spread throughout the country and it's made its way to others such as Europe and Asia, but it's primarily practiced here in North America. Since Twitchell's passing, this group has had several successors and remains popular today. Despite being a registered nonprofit, the group sells its founders materials for a hefty profit and there are allegations that virtually all of the books are plagiarized. Come on, you know by now cults love fraud. Happy Science could have you looking sad in number 3. Far right nationalism meets new age spiritualism in the Japanese Happy Science cult. Founded by Rahio Okawa in 1986, he had been a cult member himself in the God Light Association. Okawa decides to dip and start his own cult of personality when he realized that being a cult leader could prove to be a lot more profitable than being an anonymous corporate employee and a cult follower. Okawa pitches in his sermons that he is a human incarnate 
interpretation of a supreme being called El Cantare, who combines Christ and Buddha and Muhammad and every other prophetic deity to create a nine dimensional heaven with him at the head and of course can communicate with the celestial. He predicts that some of these celestials might visit us one day bearing the apocalypse. He's also convinced that there's a space alliance that forbids any kind of insta -teller attacks or war between planets. Apparently some representatives could already be here living among us so remember that the next time you start trash talking the aliens. Here's where the strangeness picks up a notch, he also created a massively complex mythology of new age nonsense while simultaneously founding an extremist political wing called the Happiness Realization Party. His party advocates the vicious Japanese nationalism devoted to denying historical cruelties, advocating for conflict with China and North Korea, and to rebuild Japan's infrastructure. The group claims to have 12 million members around the world, has multimedia arm, and enjoys a tax exempt status in the USA as a church. Let's get biblical, biblical! Number 2, the 12 tribes. So sorry for how cringy that was. The 12 tribes take holistic and traditional practices to exploit under the guise of new age hippiedom. The Christian fundamentalist cult was born in 1970s led by Albert Eugene Spriggs and his wife Marsha in Tennessee. They advertise their nature communes and 70 themes diners and cafes while it's behind closed doors, their practices are far less than free love. There is a belief that slavery was a marvelous opportunity for black people and the support of conversion camps for the LGBTA who they think the world should be rid of. The 12 tribes tries to keep its extremist teachings from outsiders and even some of their inside members. But former members and experts on fringe religious movements who have helped followers escape paint a pretty horrific picture of life in the group. Black and LGBTA members especially suffer, as once indoctrination is over, members change tune and become aggressive towards them. Their followers sacrifice their earthy possessions to live in any of the many communes and follow the teachings of the modern day apostle with no deviation lest they risk being ostracized by the cult and damned to an apocalyptic lake of fire. Members must work for free in the commune stores and cafes, their access to internet, secular books, movies, everything, worldly influences of any kind are extremely restricted. In its 50 years running, 12 tribes distinguish itself from other tribes with legal businesses, operations such as food services, construction, soap making, woodworking, farming, solar energy, and even an Alaskan fishing operation. By members living communally, sharing money and resources, and all businesses staffed by followers who work without pay, ex-members told the Denver Post this is how the cult perfectly constructed to leave you with nothing should you choose to leave. This next cult is one of unbelievable brutality, it's the Narco Santicos at number one. Okay, so that's a word and a half, but it essentially means the satanic doobie dealers led by Adolfo de Jesus Costanzo. Its members were traffickers and deeply disturbed people. Having studied Paolo Meombe from a young age, Adolfo took fascination with the concept of remains having religious purposes and affiliations. This fascination grew and while Paolo isn't inherently evil and can be used for great good, Adolfo was also exposed to his mother's criminal behavior and criminal consorts as a child as well as rampant poverty, which were huge influences on his future life of crime. I'm going to keep this vague because the victims deserve to be acknowledged more than the crime. After moving back to Mexico as a teen, Adolfo made a group of friends who indulged his radical and bizarre opinions about the benefits of animal and even human sacrifice in the name of deities. They began to run a profitable business casting spells to bring good luck using Adolfo's Palo background and some made up mojo, involving expensive ritual sacrifices of chickens, goats, snakes, zebras, and lion cubs. Many gangs and high ranking politicians visited the group on their ranch property for these spells. It's here the group indulged in the use of heavy substances and the religious factor was metamorphosized into dark magic intensely. Believing the magic he took from Paolo Meombe may be the success of their cartel and the spell business, Adolfo realized that if the dead bones in his Naganga altar worked this well, how well would live ones? Tragically, this realization resulted in the sacrifice of over 20 people, which most had incredibly inhumane ends. The cycle breaks, however, with Mark Kilroy, an American who had been abducted and sadly perished by the group's hand. American authorities put pressure on Mexico and forced their police to find out that a cult leader had been under their noses all along. Adolfo refused to go to prison and went down in a literal blaze of glory, never facing punishments for his crime. 14 other members were arrested and charged, and American authorities still wait for the release of three of these members from life sentences in Mexico for their turn to be prosecuted in the USA. Well, I hope you're all culted out now that we've hit the end of our countdown. I hope you learned something new and fascinating today. Be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more from us. And remember, if you have to ask yourself if it's a cult, it's probably a cult.